Our reading tonight comes from the book of Genesis, chapter 15. Genesis, chapter 15. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision, saying, Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your exceeding great reward. But Abram said, Lord God, what will you give me? seeing I go childless, and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. Then Abram said, Look, you have given me no offspring. Indeed, one born in my house is my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, saying, This one shall not be your heir, but one whom will come from your own body shall be your heir. Then he brought him outside and said, Look now toward heaven, And count the stars, if you are able to number them. And he said to him, So shall your descendants be. And he believed in the Lord, and he accounted it to him for righteousness. Then he said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldees to give you this land to inherit it. And he said, Lord God, how shall I know that I will inherit it? So he said to him, Bring me a three-year-old heifer, a three-year-old female goat, a three-year-old ram, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. Then he brought all these to him, and cut them in two, down the middle, and placed each piece opposite the other, but he did not cut the birds in two. And when the vultures came down on the carcasses, Abram drove them away. Now when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram, And behold, horror and great darkness fell upon him. Then he said to Abram, Know certainly that your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not theirs, and will serve them, and they will afflict them four hundred years. And also the nation whom they serve I will judge. Afterward they shall come out with great possessions. Now as for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace, You shall be buried at a good old age, but in the fourth generation they shall return here, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. And it came to pass, when the sun went down and it was dark, that, behold, there appeared a smoking oven and a burning torch that passed between those pieces. On the same day the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, To your descendants I have given this land, From the river of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates, the Kenites, the Kenizzites, the Cadmonites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Rephaim, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Girgashites, and the Jebusites. Amen. My message tonight comes from the Song of Solomon. And I'd like us to look at a verse in the second chapter of the Song of Songs. The Song of Songs, chapter 2, verse 3. The third verse in chapter 2 of the Song of Solomon. Like an apple tree among the trees of the woods, so is my beloved among the sons. I sat down in his shade with great delight. And his fruit was sweet to my taste. As the title suggests, these uh, love songs were uh, composed uh, by King Solomon under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And at first sight, uh, he is describing human love, uh, the love uh, between uh, himself and the Shulamites, Uh, soon to be uh, his uh, bride. Now, there is no denying that there is a celebration here uh, of uh, that horizontal human love. But on closer analysis, and if uh, you are uh, given the illumination of the Holy Spirit, you soon discover uh, that there is a far greater and a deeper love here, the vertical love. Uh, between uh, the greater than Solomon, Jesus Christ, uh, and his people. Uh, In the New Testament, 
the Lord Jesus is described as the bridegroom and those who are trusting in him, uh, his true church, they are the bride and there's soon to be a marriage. Uh, that's what we've got to look forward to, the marriage supper of the Lamb. And if we want a description of uh, what a Christian is, uh, then there is uh, no uh, lovelier one than this uh, in the Song of Songs 2-3. Uh, it is uh, the bride that is speaking, and she's describing her uh, king. And uh, we can take it first as uh, human love, but I'm not so much going to look at that tonight. I'm more interested in this love of Jesus Christ. Now, whenever uh, we have a wedding, uh, we uh, see that uh, this um, marriage that we are witnessing is a reflection of that marriage made in heaven uh, between uh, the Lord Jesus and the believer. Uh, so you have a collection of songs in this book. Um, it's like an album of songs, and this is one of my favourite songs. And I just want us to look at this tonight, where the Shulamites, which we're taking as a type of the believer, uh, is describing uh, her Lord and Saviour as an apple tree. Now, that's very strange, is it not? Uh, when did you last describe uh, your loved one as an apple tree? It, it doesn't sound very uh, complimentary. But let, let's start looking at uh, this description and ask, what is it that's true of an apple tree that is also true of Jesus Christ and the effect that he has uh, on those who trust in him. Now, we must remember that uh, this is the Middle East that uh, is uh, being spoken of, so it's not uh, the apple trees that we have over here. Uh, I have an apple tree in the man's garden, and it's not much to look at. Uh, but in uh, the uh, country of Palestine, uh, the apple trees were much more majestic um, I remember once going to India, and it was around October time, and it was the season for custard apples. Now, custard apples are not like our uh, little apples. They are big things, and uh, they have very tough uh, skins. But once you open them, you've got these little uh, pieces that are covered in what looks like custard. Uh, very sweet. It's delicious. And they're bigger trees as well. So maybe uh, this apple tree is something like that. I'm not saying it is, but it's a majestic tree. And this is the best place to start. When we think of Jesus Christ, what's the first thing that we can say concerning him? Well, surely this is it. He is majestic. Um, I remember reading a book by W.H. Murray on the Scottish Highlands and on mountaineering up in that part of the country, one of the first books to describe uh, those mountains being discovered. And there's a mountain up in the northwest Highlands called Liathach, and that's a Gaelic word which means the grey one. And there were these climbers about to ascend Liathach, and not many people had been up it. And they met uh, one of the uh, deer stalkers on the way. And when he heard that they were going to attempt to climb the earth, uh, he said to them, She, I'm not going to attempt a Scottish accent, she is majestic, but not to be tampered with. Well, let us say of our Saviour, he is majestic. And yes, he's not to be played about with but he is to be surveyed and he is to be delighted in. So we need not be afraid in that craven fear sense of the word of our Lord Jesus Christ. He is to be reverenced because he is great, but at the same time we're to draw near to him. And he, he is 
the mighty one. Uh, I'm not keen on that description by Wesley, I think, of Jesus meek and mild. He is meek, because a strong person is meek, but he's not mild. He's majestic. I much rather Titus Lewis's description, mighty Christ from time eternal, mighty he man's nature takes, mighty when on Calvary dying, mighty death itself he breaks, see his might, infinite, king of heaven and earth by right. We need to uh, reassert uh, our saviour's uh, majesty. Uh, we're, we're too uh, afraid of our society. We're too apologetic when it comes uh, to defending King Jesus. Uh, let, let me just read uh, what Paul uh, wrote in Colossians. He had to deal with people uh, who were trying to say that the worship of angels uh, was a more spiritual thing uh, than uh, being a Christian. And he wrote in Colossians 2, verse 8, Beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit, according to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world, and not according to Christ. For in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. May Christ be the one that we're obsessed about. No other ism. I can remember now as a student preaching in a church in North London and I'd preach the gospel and I was given some degree of liberty. And afterwards, as I was standing by the door, somebody came up to me and I thought they were going to ask a question like, what must I do to be saved? But do you know what he said? Are you a Baptist? Now, I've got nothing against Baptists. But dear me, after extolling Jesus Christ, what's a question to ask? When you try looking at the sun, you shouldn't, but if you ever look at the sun and then try looking at things around you, everybody's a blur because the sun has so blinded your eyes and may we be blinded by the glory of Jesus Christ, so that everything else is seen for what it really is. Isn't that what we really are, Christians? This should be the one hallmark uh, of our faith. There was a pastor, a great uh, man of peace, David Jones Langan, at the end of the 18th century. And he, as he was getting older and maybe a bit more dodder, he wrote these words, I, I may be getting older, you know, I may be losing it a bit, but I know one thing, I am seeking to reduce my Christianity to one point, Jesus Christ. So that's the first thing we can say about this apple tree that is true of our Saviour. He is majestic. And you can add to that, we haven't got time to look at it, the beauty of the tree. Uh, Solomon, a little later in this book, says he is, I bet know it better in the authorised version, yea, he is altogether lovely. He's altogether lovely. Now what else is true about this apple tree? Look at the song. Like an apple tree among the trees of the woods. Now doesn't that strike you as odd? When did you last see an apple tree in a forest? I mentioned one in my back garden. Uh, there are many apple trees in orchards, but it's very, very rare to find an apple tree in the middle of a forest growing wild. Uh, now, I don't know if you have them in this part of the country. Maybe you do. Uh, but uh, this is what is noteworthy about the beauty and the majesty of Jesus Christ. It's out of context. This God-man, this person, where would you expect to find him? In heaven, with the Father, worshipped by the angels, in purity. 
But where do we see him? We see him coming down into this world. And we see him born in a manger, becoming a man there. Uh, Let's read Philippians. This is so instructive. In the second chapter of Philippians, the Apostle Paul again uh, put it like this. Uh, Let this mind, verse 5, be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself. That's it. Like the apple tree, majestic in the forest, doesn't fit. So Jesus Christ the spotless Son of God, becoming one of us, doesn't make sense. And then being brought up where? In the palace in Jerusalem? That's where we'd have expected a king uh, to have been reared. But no, in Nazareth, Galilee, can any good thing come out of Galilee? In that backwater, it doesn't make sense for the Son of God to be growing up in that region. And who did he have as parents? Did he have the big wigs of Galilean society? Of course not. It was a carpenter and his wife. And his father, earthly father, didn't live for that long. And then when he started his public ministry, what did he have? Was it a prosperity gospel? Did he have a private jet like some of these health and wealth preachers? Did he stay in five-star hotels? Not at all. He says in one place he doesn't have anywhere to lay down his head. He didn't own a house. He was poor, like an apple tree amongst the trees of the forest. Doesn't fit. And then, when he mixed with people, what kind of people were attracted to him? Not the religious sorts. He repelled them. It was the prostitutes, the drunkards, the tax collectors, the off-scouring of society. Doesn't make sense. And then he humbled himself to the point of hanging on a cross. That's the worst form of execution ever devised by man. The Romans invented it. And he was being condemned in the worst possible way. And he was crucified alongside murderers, terrorists. Doesn't make sense. And we know why. I trust you do. It was for your sin and mine. He did not come for his own sake. He was a substitute. And thanks be to God for providing a saviour who in my place condemned he stood. Sealed my pardon with his blood. Hallelujah. What a saviour. That's why it's only a Christian who can say hallelujah. Because it's another's life, another's death that we stake our whole eternity on. So that's the other thing. You see, this apple tree In the middle of a wood, the pure spotless Son of God becoming one of us, even our substitutes. When he died, we died. How did Paul put it in 2 Corinthians 5? He who knew no sin was made sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. What a gospel. Uh, Think of the transaction taking place. Was it Calvin who called the cross the glorious exchange? Uh, Think of uh, being in debt uh, and having a bank balance that's in the red and you would need a long time to pay it back. Spiritually, we need an eternity to pay that debt because we've offended an infinite being in God. And then think of somebody coming, somebody who's rich, and saying, I'll pay that off, every penny. Well, that's what Jesus Christ did on the cross. He took all our debts, and that debt's too great for us. He cleared in a moment by the shedding of his precious blood. Isn't that wonderful? But then it's even more wonderful that the credit in his accounts is transferred 
to our accounts so that we are in credit. Jesus, thy blood and righteousness, my beauty are in glorious dress. Now, what else is true? This apple tree growing in the forest, let me apply it in this way. And before doing that, I think I've got a quotation here. Uh, Where have I got it from? Uh, How lovely Christ is uh, to the eye of faith. Uh, Undertaking our course, taking our nature upon him, suffering, bleeding and dying in our place, rising again and entering heaven for us as our forerunner, great high priest, mediator and intercessor with our names written on his heart. That was somebody, I don't know who. And then Mr. Spurgeon put it like this. The Saviour is found in a manger at Bethlehem, in a carpenter's shop at Nazareth. Amongst the poor and needy is he seen, while he sojourns amongst the sons of men. Now then, what else is true about an apple tree growing in the wild? Well, it's this. I wouldn't be happy if a stranger went into my back garden and suddenly helped himself to my apples. I don't think if we went to Herefordshire, where they have all these orchards, and if we trespassed in order to get some apples. But if you saw an apple tree in the forest, I think, in spite of all our legislation, you'd be free to take an apple for yourself. And this is the most amazing thing about Jesus Christ. He's not confined. He's not fenced. He is open. Come to the waters, everyone that thirsts. Come without money and without price. I love this hymn. Just as I am, thy love unknown has broken every barrier down. There's no fences in coming to Jesus Christ. I remember Mr. Hyam uh, telling us about somebody in the Heath very early, I think, in his ministry. Um, They came up to him and they said, Mr. Hyam, do you know there's somebody coming to church and I've seen them smoking outside. They shouldn't be allowed to come to our church. We don't want a church that's for people like that. Well, thankfully, Mr. Hyam put that person right and said... The church is for sinners. Everybody is welcome. We don't need to be good enough, just as the apple tree growing in the wild is for everybody. Is there anybody here tonight who feels that they're not good enough for Jesus Christ, that they're not the sort to come to him? My friends, none of us are. Every one of us is a sinner. I'm still a sinner. I'm a saved sinner. But in myself, I'm still unworthy. But he invites sinners. And he is the friend of sinners. Not the righteous, but sinners, Jesus came to call. It doesn't matter where you are. You can go to the worst place in the Rumney Valley. Jesus Christ is just as much a saviour there as he is in a church. So those are a few things about this apple tree. It's majestic. It grows in the forest. A strange place. And it's for everybody. And then look at the effects of it. I sat down in his shade. (laughs) I like that. We've had some hot days recently. And... If you ever go out walking on the hills on a warm, sultry day, then one of the best sights is some woodland. Because you could go under those trees, and it is so refreshing, really. And that's the first thing that Solomon describes, or not Solomon, uh, the Shulamites. Uh, She says, just like a tree protecting me from the heat of the sun on a hot day, so is my beloved. I can sit under him and be refreshed. Now, this is very important. I read from Genesis 15, because God there came to Abram and said to him, Abram, be not afraid. I am your shield. 
That's what a shield does. It protects us from danger. And that's the most important thing about Jesus Christ uh, this evening. Uh, He's the only protection. Uh, Let me read this. I don't know this hymn well enough to be able to recite it off by heart. Do you know this one? Beneath the cross of Jesus, I fain would take my stand. The shadow of a mighty rock within a weary land, a home within the wilderness, a rest upon the way from the burning of the noontide heat and the burden of the day. O safe and happy shelter, O refuge, tried and sweet. Here am I, a convicted sinner, knowing that I'm under the righteous anger of God and that if I'm going to continue like this, I'm going to die condemned and I need shelter. There is a storm coming and I need to be protected from it. And there is no one in this world, there is nowhere in this life that is able to offer that to me but Jesus Christ. And I flee to him. I knew a pastor who was um, in Sandfields and uh, he had men in his congregation who worked in the Port Albert Steelworks and a few of them would have to go into the blast furnace and they would wear these protective suits uh, to keep them from the heat. They would die if they would go there in normal clothing, but these protective suits would protect them. And so is Jesus Christ. Now think, uh, please forgive me for being a bit basic here, but think of the sun's rays. When you're sitting under the shelter of a tree, you're not having uh, the heat come on you. Instead, the tree, the leaves and the branches and the boughs of the tree are taking the heat. And that's what happened on the cross, you know. God is angry. He is just. He must punish sin. And on the cross, there was that demonstration of the full uh, vent of the righteous anger of God. And just like the tree taking all the heat, so Jesus Christ on the cross took all the righteous anger of God for his people. Isn't that amazing? Uh, I have sometimes used this illustration. Forgive the change of metaphor. I'm thinking of rain now, not heat. (laughs) Typically a Welsh uh, theme. Uh, Apparently the wettest place in Wales is Nanmore in the middle of Snowdonia uh, because the prevailing winds come from the southwest and so the air, uh, which is already moist, having come over the Atlantic Ocean, once it hits Snowdonia... Uh, it has to rise, and as it rises, it cools and it condenses, and it uh, forms uh, even uh, more precipitation, and it all comes down on Snowdonia, and little Nanmore receives so much rain then. And then once that rain descends the other side of the mountains, it's drier. They call it the rain shadow effect. It's on the lee of the mountains, and then you've got... Uh, the uh, Riviera of North Wales, Llandidno and Colwyn Bay and Rhyl. It's drier because the mountains have taken the brunt of the rain. My friends, have you ever sheltered under the lee of Mount Calvary? Because on that cross, Jesus Christ took the storm for your sins and mine. It was all poured out on him and when we're trusting in him all we're doing is sheltering on the lee side and there's no more clouds there we're now in the sunshine of God's love so just as those mountains takes the rain just as the tree takes the heat so we sheltering under the cross are safe there's no better place to be I remember now, going to university, I wasn't saved when I went. I was religious, but I wasn't a Christian. And I was convicted of my sin and of my need of a saviour. And I cried to him to save me. I still thought I had to do something. And then one day, God showed me he had done everything, Jesus Christ. And this joy flooded into my heart that my sins were forgiven. 
and I was happy. I was safe for all eternity. Uh, even as a student with not much money, I would go and walk on the promenade and I would look at the people in the Bellevue Hotel and I did not envy them one bit because I was rich in Jesus Christ. And those of you here tonight who have come to trust in him, you are blessed as well. Oh, safe and happy shelter. Oh, refuge, tried and sweet. Listen to Top Lady. You can't beat Top Lady for blending theology with poetry. He puts it like this. The terrors of law and of God with me can have nothing to do. My Saviour's obedience and blood hide all my transgressions from view. So here is this apple tree offering us protection. Are you there? That's what a Christian is. A Christian isn't a person doing this or believing this. A Christian is a person who's in a different place. We were once in the kingdom of darkness, but now we've been translated into the kingdom of light. We were once exposed to the wrath of God, but now we're sheltering under the lee of Mount Calvary. We haven't done anything. God has done something in us. And then there's one more thing about this apple tree. Not only is it a shelter, not many trees can provide this. His fruit was sweet to my taste. When I go out walking in the mountains and I see a forest that can offer me shelter uh, on a hot day, they're usually conifer trees. You can't eat anything from a conifer tree. <laughs> but an apple tree, oh, it's not just shelter. It's food. You, you, you can't quite live on apples, but they'll keep you going. And don't you find that to be so with Jesus Christ? He's not just forgiven us. That's wonderful that I'm able to go to heaven on the basis of his work. But more than that, he delights our souls. Even in this day of small things, we can truly say how sweet the name of Jesus sounds in a believer's ear. In Welsh, they've translated that, and it's a bit better. It says, Mor beraidd i'r credadin gwan yw hyfryd enw Christ. How sweet the name of Jesus is to the weak believer. I think that's good. It soothes his sorrows, heals his wounds, and drives away his fears. You know, there's a difference even between an apple and an orange. The orange juice will refresh you, but it's tangy, even a bit acidic. I can't drink orange juice before preaching. <laughs> it upsets my stomach. But the apple juice is crisp and refreshing. And that's what we need, my friends, at this moment. It's a wilderness out there spiritually. And this gospel that we've come to believe in isn't just something uh, for the unbeliever. It's not just the ABC of the gospel that we go through and then we move on to higher things. Oh, no, if it wasn't for this gospel, I don't think I could keep going in the spiritual realm. It's the same gospel that sweetens our palates, that refreshes our souls. The same gospel. We simply get deeper into the love of Christ. So can I just finish by asking you, where, where, where are you at spiritually? We used to have a man uh, come and preach in the Christian Union and he would startle us all afterwards by not doing small talk. He used to ask us, how, how is your soul? Qu quite a frightening question when you haven't asked you before. And by God's grace, I was enabled to come to the place where I was saying, it is well with my soul. Not because of anything I've done, but because I found Jesus Christ. And you know what? As you get older, you really see this world as a battleground. It's not a playground, it's a battle. And there are wounds, and there are scars, there are disappointments. It's a tough life, the Christian life. But haven't you found this to be so? He becomes more precious as we become more aware of our frailties. 
we are amazed at Christ's long-suffering and his tenderness to us. And how often have we been refreshed in a desert land by the love of Jesus Christ. Christian, realize that those broken cisterns are not going to fill your soul's deepest desires. We found once that we tried those broken cisterns and found them all to fail. Let us not return to them. Let us always flee to this sure, happy shelter and not just find forgiveness, but find our souls being nourished. May may God uh, bless us uh, in these dark days and may we ever look to Jesus Christ And I don't know which song it is, but there's an old, I think, Negro spiritual song, which we're not going to sing now because I don't know it, but it uses this verse to describe Jesus Christ as our apple tree. Is he an apple tree to you tonight? May God, by his grace, make us all shelter under him and taste of his sweetness for his namesake.